The subject of this program is sexuality. It contains explicit images and content meant for a mature audience. Viewer discretion is advised. 19th century Egypt, near the Valley of the Kings. An extraordinary discovery is made. Contained within a fragile pot are some of the most graphic images from the ancient world. It would become known as the Turin Erotic Papyrus and would be one of the most controversial artifacts ever found from the ancient world. It's full-on pornography, really. Even by today's standards, the images on the 3,000-year-old papyrus are explicit. If you sit and look at it, I think you have to be looking at one of the most shocking sets of images from the whole of antiquity. How does this one discovery change our perception of ancient Egypt? The Egyptians, we tend to think of being much more buttoned up and repressed, but actually that's completely wrong. What intimate messages are hidden among all the symbols, codes, and clues? Egypt is the untold story of the ancient world. If we can decode the sexual mores, the customs, the morals, the laws of ancient Egypt, we can understand for the first time what was really happening between the sheets in ancient Egypt. Turin, Italy. Among the collection of artifacts in the Egyptian museum, the largest in the world outside Cairo, one item stands out. Papyrus 55001, more commonly known as the Turin Erotic Papyrus. It's a very explicit sexual document from ancient Egypt. It's a very rare example because there aren't all that many of that kind. Depicted within its fragments are images of 12 ordinary men and women in explicit sexual positions. For centuries, it was kept out of public view. It was locked away in libraries and you had to go and register to look at it and have a very good reason for looking at it. And then it was only men. So in the Victorian times when it was published, women would have no good reason to go and look at something as filthy as the Turin papyrus. The controversy that has always followed the Turin erotic papyrus has created a mystery. Even today, we don't know its true meaning. Does it portray the sex lives of the gods and provide a coded message to the afterlife? Is it part of an elaborate and mystical ritual of conception? Or is it simply a relic of everyday erotica, an ancient pornographic magazine? Now, for the first time on television, we will decode this ancient puzzle. By deciphering its images and symbols, we will discover its true meaning and gain a more intimate view of the sexual lives of ancient Egyptians. By looking at the data we have for ancient Egyptian sexuality, we get a sense of the people as they actually were, with the same issues, the same emotions, the same desires as us. And I think that view of them is much more interesting than just seeing them as strange, exotic figures dominated by mummies, myths, magic, and pyramids. For centuries, the sex lives of ancient Egypt were overshadowed by other civilizations. The Greeks and the Romans have the reputation for being very lustful societies, and that's partly because of the evidence that they've left behind. We see orgiastic scenes on their dinner services or, or bestial action on tombstones. The full view of ancient Egypt was obscured. The ancient Egyptians were a very sensuous, sensual society. For an ancient Egyptian, it was very, very important that you were an actively sexual creature. It was a cover-up, aided by historians themselves. Sexual artifacts recovered from ancient Egypt were often subject to censorship. We've lost some of the sexuality from the ancient world. In Italy, for example, the popes decreed that all genitalia should be covered up with fig leaves. And in the Victorian period, as well in the UK, this was not something which people wanted to see. One such example is the mutilated statue of Min, the Egyptian god of fertility, kept at the British Museum. Significantly, the statue is missing one important item. During the Victorian era, the penis would be removed in order to save the blushes of people visiting the museum. There's also another example of Armin Min, but on a wall inscription. In this case, Min's penis could not be removed. He had to be censored in a much more amusing way. 
in the Petrie Museum. The penis was covered up with the museum number, nicely put over it, again, so that no one would actually see such a disgraceful thing in the public eye. Even today, some sexual images are kept hidden from the public. Close to where the Turin erotic papyrus was discovered on the west bank of Thebes, there is an archaeological site, 3,000 years old, kept secret from thousands of visitors nearby. It contains one of the earliest slanderous pornographic images in history, and it remains concealed in a cave. Not simply due to the nature of the image itself, but because of whom the image is thought to depict. Hatshepsut, one of ancient Egypt's few female rulers. It's possible that it's the oldest piece of sexual graffiti in the world. It's certainly not the oldest image of people having sex, but possibly the oldest piece of graffiti showing this kind of act. The drawing is located on the site of a temple in honor of the queen. Creating such a sexually explicit image would have been dangerous for the artist. An image of the queen in a sexual position was a serious no-no, for sure, and would have been something that had to be hidden away, something that the person would probably get in serious trouble for if they were found out. Due to the controversial nature of this graffito, few academics have accessed the cave. For this program, we have been given permission to investigate this unique archaeological site. They block up the site to keep visitors out, and nobody gets to go in, usually. So now I'm getting to go in, and I'm very excited. So we're going to take the door down, and we're going to go in. OK. Ah, shukran. Wow. Oh, wow, this is, this is something. It is not known who cut the limestone cave but it is thought to be one of the craftsmen from the Valley of the Kings, who may have decided that it would be a good location for his own tomb. For a number of years, Liz has wanted to access this remote site. Wow, this is fantastic. Oh, yeah. I've only seen it in books, and it's really good to see it in real life. This graffito was probably created by one of the workers from around this area, so probably a tomb worker uh, or even a temple worker. The graffiti shows what appears to be Hatshepsut suit being taken from behind by who they think could be Senenmut, her steward and possible lover. Details of the drawing provide clues to its significance have the male behind uh, a female, and it's believed that it might be Sinanmut and Hatshepsut. Because we have here the headdress, uh, they think it's maybe the Nimi's headdress, which would have been a sign of royalty. And since it's obviously a female figure, they thought, well, this was probably Hatshepsut. Why would someone take the enormous risk of portraying a royal figure in such explicit terms? This was the artist's way of showing his distaste at the fact that they did have a female king. It went against the laws of Mart. It went against everything that Egypt stood for. The graffito offers a new view of the Turin erotic papyrus. When matched against the Turin images, it shows similarities to one of the 12 sexual intercourse positions depicted. Could it also have been a slanderous message? The graffito does provide an uncensored glimpse of everyday life in ancient Egypt. It seems like it's a unique window into the world of the tomb workers that lived in this area and their concepts of sex in, in a completely different way than they were allowed to show in the temples and tombs. Because they spent most of their time really showing things that only were part of this idea of decorum. And in here, they could express themselves in a, in a completely different way. But Egyptologists still face an incomplete picture of sexual life in ancient Egypt. To get the full intimate details, we must piece together the true meaning of the Turin erotic papyrus. Could they be messages to the kings and queens of ancient Egypt, or perhaps to an even higher power? To find out, we must explore the tombs and temples of the gods. There, the walls are filled with hidden codes, and if you know where to look, the sexual messages are everywhere. 
we are decoding an ancient sexual artifact known as the Turin Erotic Papyrus. Could it be a message to Egyptian royalty, like this piece of graffito found near the Valley of the Kings? Or could it be a message to a higher power, a message to the gods? To find out, we must enter the sacred temples, the gateway to the afterlife. Here, the images contain a code, symbols filled with sexual messages. In religious iconography on temple walls, you see a lot of gods with huge erections, you see deities having sex, but Egyptian temples are very much enclosed spaces, which very few people would have access to. Journeying along the River Nile, a team of experts will enter the sacred heart of Egypt's most important temples. By analyzing their artwork, they can unlock their hidden meaning. In contrast to the showy, pornographic world of ancient Rome, Egyptian sex is much more coded, much more symbolically displayed. Central to the tombs was the idea that when you died, your body would need to go to the afterlife. The tombs were portals, and sex would be an important part of that transition. When you die, the idea is it's not the end of life, it's the beginning of a new life, and the beginning of new life starts with birth. So you do have the sexuality and fertility aspects associated with everything to do with death and the funerary rituals. Dr. Lisa Manike is one of the leading experts in the sexual history of ancient Egypt. She has been studying Egyptian tomb art for the last 45 years. On the walls of some of the tomb chapels, we have a number of scenes that look like scenes out of daily life, the ideal daily life scenes, parties, banquets, etc. But they all have a funerary purpose because they are on the walls of a tomb chapel. The ancient Egyptians believed these images were instrumental in the act of being reborn. This is sex in disguise, you may call it like that. It is a picture of the ideal occasion in real life. In order to be reborn, you have to have the sexual activities that goes before any birth, birth or rebirth. Symbols that we see on the temple walls are also present on the Turin erotic papyrus. The key word here is the lotus flower. The lotus flower is a symbol of resurrection probably had narcotic properties, so it's not without reason that they're sniffing these lotus flowers, but they're just everywhere. There are also other similarities between the codes here and our mysterious papyrus, symbols that also ring true today. Sex is greatly facilitated, I think, the initial steps uh, by means of alcohol, and the Egyptian knew that, and we always have this triangle of sexuality, of music, uh, and uh, of drunkenness. It really goes together. It did then as it does today. The messages reveal that sex was central to rebirth in the afterlife, but their interpretation can be complex. Sexuality was of paramount importance, and it is displayed not directly, but through symbols. Leaving the temples of Luxor behind, Lisa is traveling to the Egyptian capital, Cairo, to study one of the most important finds from the ancient world, the treasures of Tutankhamun. Hidden on a 3,500-year-old clothes chest, Lisa believes she has found a significant clue to how the ancient Egyptians depicted sex in a covert manner. This is a clothes chest that was found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. On it we see a picture of the king sitting on a chair, shooting bow and arrow. At his feet we have his wife, Queen Anges and Amun, who is holding an arrow ready for him to shoot. The mere fact that he's actually shown in that position, shooting with bow and arrow, takes us to the uh, real significance of this scene, the symbolic, encoded message. The key to this clue is its double meaning. The word seti in Egyptian means shooting, but it also means to ejaculate, which has a very sexual significance, because they wanted to be reborn in the hereafter, in the afterlife. And in order to be reborn, they had to have some sexual activity beforehand. And this is what is explained here in a coded message. And this is a way of visualizing this very vital sexual energy which they needed to be reborn. Hunting was a common metaphor for sexual prowess in the ancient world. Similar codes have been found on the tomb wall of an accountant named Nebamun. It shows Nebamun accompanied by his wife, his young daughter, 
and he's out in the marshes hunting birds and catching fish. And it is also, of course, an intensely erotic scene to the original audience's eyes. Traveling through the marshes is known to be an ancient Egyptian euphemism for having sex. All of these overtones of fertility, productivity, sensuality, all combine in this image to suggest how Nebamun will be reborn in the eternal life, how he'll continue very much as a sexual, sensual being. Could the Turin erotic papyrus have been a link to the afterlife? Could it have been a coded message to the gods? It does show the 12 positions of intercourse. Whether they relate to this world or the next or to the world of the gods, that is very much debated at the moment. To find out, we must first explore the sex lives of the ancient Egyptian gods themselves. Only certain people would be able to come into this part of the temple, probably priests, uh, not ordinary people who would be kept outside the temple precinct. So these images would be hidden and wouldn't be a part of what the everyday people would be seeing. Three hours south of Luxor is the Temple of Abydos. Hieroglyph symbols provide clues that sex was important to the ancient Egyptian gods. The ancient Egyptians had two ways of writing their language, one of which was in hieroglyphics, or sacred carved writings. There's a lot of symbolic imagery behind both the illustrations themselves and the writing system, because each individual hieroglyph is in fact a picture of something. There are a lot of different meanings, things can be read in a variety of different ways. In this section right here, you can see this one particular sign, which is a phallus. The phallus is part of the Egyptian repertoire of hieroglyphic signs, and it can have one of many meanings, but it is indeed a very sexual symbol. The phallus hieroglyph signifies masculinity, aggression, fertility, and sexual power, revealing a sexual side to the gods. Sex was deeply ingrained into religious beliefs. The whole of Egyptian society is certainly based around sex in the sense that they understood its importance and its significance and that without the sexual act, their society wouldn't continue. Sex was also central to ancient Egyptian creation myths. Contained within the British Museum is an ancient papyrus which shows how the Egyptians believed their gods performed sexual acts to create the world. It's a rare piece of evidence which reveals that sex formed a magical and mystical aspect to religious beliefs in ancient Egypt. In one way, the Egyptians are very different from us. They are very discreet about human sexual activity. But when it comes to the gods, the iconography to us seems just to be simply pornographic. To represent how self-sustaining and fertile the earth is, the ancient Egyptians show the autophilatio of the earth god Geb. It's not something we would consider putting in a religious context, still less burying as a religious document with a priestess of the main god of the time. The men in the Turin erotic papyrus are all exceptionally endowed, like the god Geb. Rather than mere mortals, could these men and their sexual acts be a depiction of gods in the afterlife? To investigate further, we must go into the temples of Abydos. Deep within its chambers is a phallic symbol linked to the story of Isis and Osiris, a mythical tale of life and rebirth. We're going into the chapel of Ta Sokar, and there's a few really interesting reliefs that are located here that show the god Osiris. Here we have an image uh, of the mummiform Osiris shown on a bed with the goddess Isis as a bird located on top of his erect phallus. The scene is a lot more coded than you would see in a tomb or uh, it, maybe even a graffiti or whatnot because it shows the gods. And so you don't have the image of Isis as a woman, you have an image of Isis shown as a kite or a bird of prey. This was probably not a shocking image to the Egyptians though. Uh, it's something that just showed the power of Osiris through his phallus, and it was very important to show these two on a different level than, say, the rest of the, the divinities or even the rest of the population at large. Even today, this sexual artifact still holds a certain power for some visitors. The site attracts women to the temples who are in search of the magic of the gods to help them. 
the phallus has been kind of either chipped out, it's been touched, guardians come in, people come in and want to touch it and kind of be part of this power. Even today, people go into temples and want to be part of this fertility that could even make them pregnant in modern day times. So the coded symbols and graphic depictions were not just a way to be reborn into the afterlife. They were linked to fertility in everyday life and the act of sex itself. For some, this would all be revealed, all take place in a dark, intimate room called the best chamber. The Turin erotic papyrus offers a shocking but cryptic image of sex in ancient Egypt. To understand its meaning, we are decoding other sexual images from the era. They reveal that sexuality was connected with the gods and helped the transition into the afterlife. But how did this affect ordinary Egyptians in their everyday lives? For the ancient Egyptians, sexuality was very much just a part of daily life. From the few settlement sites that we have, we can see that they lived in fairly small houses and would have lived on top of each other, quite literally. So the sexual act would have been fairly visible to all the family. Sex, conception, and fertility were closely linked with the gods, with one god in particular. Bess is the god of fertility. He is the protector of pregnant women. He's the protector of young children. How did ordinary Egyptians trying to conceive interact with the god Bess? A fascinating new site may provide intriguing answers. It is situated 22 miles south of Cairo in Saqqara, which is also known as the City of the Dead. At Saqqara, there are the so-called best chambers, four little rooms decorated with uh, figures of best and naked women on the walls. Mystery still surrounds this incubation, or best chamber. These chambers seem to have been used by people who were having trouble conceiving. Perhaps they came there to sleep the night in the chamber and to go away expectantly hoping to conceive. Perhaps they came to receive advice from the priests of the god himself. Bess is first and foremost a deity connected with everyday life. He was considered to bring good luck and prosperity to married couples and their children. He also played a vital role in the ritual of childbirth. Childbirth is always a dangerous time, and so various rites have to be performed. And certain gods are really dedicated to watching over the new mother and the new child, such as Bess. There's also a sense he's the household familiar. He's a bit of a comic character. The mystical rites that surrounded Bess were also important in warding off evil spirits during childbirth. In the Manchester Museum is a unique Bess mask, which may have been worn during childbirth by a priestess. This mask may have been worn by a dancer who would have been involved in a ritual, some kind of ritual dance to protect the household and protect the women. As well as ritual masks, priests would also use magic wands in the process of childbirth. They were used to maybe draw a circle, protective barrier around the mother and child, doing a ritual like encircling you to ward off evil and to, to keep goodness in might actually be a very comforting thing for the mother in labor. Bess is also believed to have a more erotic charge. One theory suggests that he was used to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. A mural has been discovered which shows Bess tattooed on a young Egyptian woman. Tattoos in Egyptian society were almost exclusively drawn on the most erotic parts of the female body. What we've got here is a New Kingdom fertility figurine. She's got tattoos across her buttocks. There's a line of dots, um, rather like a belt, also a sign of fertility and sexuality. Another interesting feature is the fact she doesn't have any feet. And the reason for this is so that when she's placed into the tomb, she doesn't run away taking her fertility with her. Egyptologists believe these statuettes called Brides of the Dead were symbols of fertility and rejuvenation. Strange markings on tattooed mummies have led other scholars to ask if tattoos were used to protect the unborn child. One theory is that dots were tattooed on a woman's abdomen. During childbirth, as the stomach expands, the dots would create a net-like structure protecting the child. But there is another side to the god Bess. 
He's also the patron god of dancing, music, singing, getting drunk, all the, the sort of fun party aspects. Another depiction of Bess on the thigh of an Egyptian woman is shown on a blue bowl which dates to 1300 BC. The woman depicted is a musician, which is apt, as sex and music were very much linked. Today, modern belly dancers use coin belts to accentuate the sensuality of the movements, as well as the sounds. And sound would be a key signifier of sex in ancient Egypt. There are also scenes of music because music and uh, sexuality go together. Images of music and dancing would signify another association with the gods. One goddess in particular reveals another side to sex for the ordinary Egyptian. The goddess known as Hathor, the daughter of the sun god Ra, was the most important deity in one's sexual life. She was the goddess of physical love and spiritual love. There was one object that was particularly important in the cult of Hathor, and that's what's called the sistrum, a sacred rattle, which has a picture of Hathor on it. And whenever anybody rattled and made a noise with such a sistrum, it meant that the goddess was present, she was there. Could this sound have heralded a sexual act? We see in many tomb scenes dating as far back as the Old Kingdom where there are scantily clad women who are dancing and shaking these sistra as part of a ritual celebration. The coded references on the temple walls between sex and music are mirrored on the Turin erotic papyrus. Via our reconstruction, we have also discovered a sistrum on the papyrus suggesting that the goddess Hathor is present in the sexual acts being carried out. The gods and their rituals were seen to aid fertility and ultimately the physical act of sex. But how did ordinary ancient Egyptians feel about sex? The Turin erotic papyrus provides a startling glimpse back 3,000 years. Through exploring the daily sex lives of ancient Egypt, can we unlock its graphic images? We know that some sexual images are connected with the gods and others with the rituals of fertility. But could the Turin erotic papyrus have simply been ancient pornography? To find out, we must first understand what the ordinary Egyptian considered erotic. To do this, we must return to the site where the erotic papyrus may have been discovered. It is an important settlement that was occupied by the workmen who built the Valley of the Kings. Known as Deir el Medina, it has provided key evidence for unlocking some of the mysteries of ancient sex. At Deir el Medina, we get a sense of the smut, we get a sense of the adultery, we get a sense of how people thought and felt about sex. Sources recovered from the village indicate that as many as 100 individuals lived in the community for much of its history. Here we are, high above the village of Deir Medina. Over on the other side of the mountain is the Valley of the Kings. And not only do we have the village here, but we also have the, ha the tombs of the workers who uh, went to work in the Valley of the Kings to excavate and decorate the tombs. These construction workers and craftsmen left clues. These workers were on a 10-day week, so they'd go off and they'd do their jobs, clearly building up a bit of sexual tension over those 10 days, and then come back and release themselves on their women. Um, so what you don't know is whether this is a, a kind of archaeological record of the actual sex lives of the workers, or whether it's a kind of fantasy of this is the perfect sex that you'd get after that long 10-day week. The ancient name of the site was Setmat, the place of truth. It came into existence in the reign of Amenhotep I, perhaps sometime about 1520, 1510 BC, and it existed for uh, over 400 years. It is now viewed as a microcosm of Egyptian society. You would find people who were extraordinarily literate because they were scribes and artists. So compared to other villages all over Egypt, this is a very, very special place. The site has yielded a wealth of artifacts and texts that provide vital information about the way these people lived and how they viewed sex. 
This papyrus has survived from the late New Kingdom period in around 1500 BC. It reveals the sexual antics of an artisan. It describes him sleeping with a married woman and her daughter, who is then passed on to his son. And there is no site which provides as much information on daily life in ancient Egypt as this site does. The site provides so much lasting archaeological information simply because the area surrounding the Valley of the Kings consists of limestone. This provided the workmen with shards of rock that they could use as sketchbooks. In their Medina have been found lots of flakes of limestone with wonderful drawings on them, which the craftsmen sat and did while they were having their time off when they are not working over in the Valley of the Kings. Known as Ostraca, thousands have been found. They have been proven to be fascinating and important slices of ancient history. This is a small flake of limestone from the village of Dale Medina, and on it there's a doodle, a cartoon, done by the workmen who decorated the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And it shows a man having sex with a woman, and beside it there's a line of hieroglyphs, and she's saying, calm now is the desire of my skin. And it seems to be a sort of parody of the religious scenes you see on temple walls. The craftsmen would use these pieces of rock as sketchbooks for their thoughts, thoughts which would reflect everyday life. Some of these drawings also have uh, erotic scenes, people having sexual intercourse, uh, which is a very rare thing in Egyptian art, even in on unofficial art. But this is the place where these things would come from. Just like Egyptian statues, these images were subject to censorship through the ages. Today, only a few remain on display to the public. Hidden in a corner of an old cabinet in the Cairo Museum is a sexual representation that is both shocking and beautiful. After persuading the museum, we were allowed to show this 3,000-year-old sketch on camera. Here we have some ostraca from uh, Deir el Medina, from Luxor. And ostraca, it's a Greek word, means like shell or um, limestone flake. And actually on this ostraca, the ancient Egyptian worker from Deir el Medina had sketched some of the daily life activities, like showing animals, showing kings, showing, you know, even relationship between men and women. Like this one, for example, it shows a man and woman uh, making love, and it's painted in black ink. The uh, man is kneeling in front of the lady, and she's wrapping her legs, her thighs, around his neck. This must have been one of the favorite ones because it has been depicted so often. It's beautifully drawn because not all the pornographic drawings are very well drawn, but this one is, from an artistic point of view, it's also a very higher quality. We begin to see a more common view of erotica in everyday life. From another image recovered from Deir el Medina, we see a young woman wearing see-through clothes, a recurring image in Egyptian society. When they represent women in uh, linen garments, and they wear long linen garments in the, the New Kingdom, they create the impression that you can see through the linen garments, which of course you couldn't. Uh, but high quality linen will cling to the shape of the body, uh, and they therefore uh, represent uh, the ghost of the body underneath, which again indicates the interest in the female uh, form. By studying ancient Egyptian love poetry, we can gain a further insight into the type of sexual fantasies that were prevalent in everyday society. These texts reveal the sensual feelings of ancient Egyptians. Around about 1500 BC, uh, we start to get evidence of this beautiful love poetry that ancient Egyptians would write to one another. The men are all described as kind of superheroes, and the ideal woman emerges wet from the Nile with her clothes clinging to her body. Bethany Hughes discovers one reference to a fantasy that is just as evocative today. This is one very good example of a bit of love poetry, which came from Deir el Medina, and it was written about 3,000 years ago. It's a lover who's writing to his girlfriend, and he describes her perfect white breast, that she has fingers like lotus flowers. He says, in her thighs, her beauty rests, and when she passes, all men turn their necks to look at her. All the clues come together to paint a vivid picture of the ultimate ancient Egyptian male fantasy a beautiful and seductive young woman 
rising, dripping wet from the sacred River Nile. It's a seductive image we could easily see in a movie or advertisement today. They were very sensitive, and if the words are anything to go by, then some of them were clearly very skilled lovers, too. So if they had the same sexual appetite as we do, did the ancients also have the same voyeuristic desires? Could the sexually explicit papyrus be the world's first men's magazine? The smoking gun that reveals the truth about sex in ancient Egypt. The Turin Erotic Papyrus is one of the most sexually explicit documents ever recovered from antiquity. Yet its true meaning remains a mystery. It's a code that needs to be cracked if we are to understand the truth about the real sex lives of the ancient Egyptians. The Turin Erotic Papyrus is a document which uh, some Egyptologists get very po-faced about. Uh, they're clearly deeply embarrassed about this sort of thing. But the plain fact is that uh, the ancient Egyptian approach to sexuality was a great deal more relaxed uh, than the attitudes that we, we find in current monotheistic societies. For much of its history, it's been kept under lock and key. The previous curator at the Egyptian Museum in Turin placed a table in front of the artifact so that no one could stare deep into its surface. We have been afforded unique access to film the papyrus. Historian Bethany Hughes has been fascinated by this artifact and is intrigued to see the object up close. It is a shocking revelation for her. What I'm looking at is completely unique in the world. There's nothing else like this. And it is a fantastic thing because it's so beautiful, it's so beautifully produced. But then when you get into it and see what the pictures are, this is where it becomes really intriguing because this is basically Playboy magazine of the ancient world. So there's a 12 erotic scenes here uh, where elderly men are having a great time with young, beautiful Egyptian girls. The severely damaged papyrus has not been treated well by time. Although sections are missing, there is enough fragmentary evidence to allow scholars to fill in this ancient jigsaw puzzle. Using this information, we have restored the papyrus to its original state using computer graphics. This is our depiction of the graphic images that the ancient Egyptians would have seen over three millennia ago. With something like the Turin erotic papyrus, it's very hard to know what it was used for. It certainly wasn't written by peasant farmers. It comes from very literate, sophisticated people. Some modern scholars have thought it's a treatise on the art of lovemaking. Some have suggested that it's a religious text. On one section of the papyrus are images of animals imitating human behavior, which has left some scholars to believe that the papyrus is meant to be humorous. So whether this was someone's way of spending the hours in the evening was to sketch this, or whether there was some deeper purpose, we don't really know. As the images come to life, various scenes are depicted showing sexual positions. One sequence shows a woman having sex on a chariot, a mysterious image to scholars. And I'm not completely sure what's going on here, because this is a very rare image in ancient Egyptian art, but, but I think what it probably is, is the chariot was a real symbol of prestige and power. So probably what you've got is a conflation of sex and violence 3,200 years ago, just as we put the two together today. The woman's hair is being pulled by the old man. Hair was very erotic in ancient Egypt. Hair was one of the most erotic things a woman could have in, in ancient Egypt, especially in the New Kingdom, the 18th and the 19th dynasty. Most Egyptians shaved their heads so they were um, bald as a way of getting rid of lice and other such horrible, noxious, crawling things in your hair. So they would wear these very elaborate wigs. Other Egyptian texts refer to hair. One states, put your wig on and let's go to bed. The idea was that the bigger and more elaborate your wig, the sexier you were. And in some of the um, 19th dynasty love poetry, they do actually refer to women being so enamored with, with their loved one that they forget what they're doing and they leave their hair half undone. And it's the equivalent of being caught naked, really, to have be caught with your wig only half prepared. Our ideas of rock and roll hedonism also seem to be present in the papyrus. Young girls servicing aging men while high on drugs. 
We see images of scantily clad young ladies involved in the sexual act. On the top of their heads depicted is a lotus flower. Now clearly they aren't wearing these lotus flowers, but the lotus flowers are symbols. And what we learn from seeing these lotus flowers is that these young women are under the influence of the narcotic that could be extracted from the lotus flower. And so what we are to understand by that is that these women are open to enjoying the sexual act. With evidence of drugs, alcohol, music and aging men, are we looking at an ancient brothel? I suspect this is a brothel. I mean, there's a lot of sexual action going on here. Um, it would be hard to imagine this was just a normal night out um, in Bronze Age Egypt. Interestingly, actually, if this is a brothel, then the prostitutes, of course, wouldn't have been paid in money because there wasn't cash at this time. So they'd have been paid for their services in something like fish or maybe a bushel of wheat. But what evidence is there of prostitutes in ancient Egypt? It's very likely prostitutes existed. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the world. We do have snippets of information that could suggest prostitution existed, one being the Turin erotic papyrus, which could be a story of a New Kingdom brothel in Thebes. Can we answer the burning questions? Who was the papyrus made for? What was it for? There's a huge debate about what is the significance of the Turin erotic papyrus. We have 12 different positions of intercourse. Some would like to relate it to the world of the gods. Others say that's a thief and priest having a night out uh, in a brothel or something like that. But um, very likely it's either a piece of early pornography. The clue here is actually the text that's written in between the figures because that gives scraps of the conversation that the parties are having. One image shows a woman pleasuring herself on an ancient pot known as an amphora. She paints her lips as she does so. The text next to this picture is still visible. At first glance, what you see is that she's applying lipstick. She's kind of jabbing it on with a long brush, staring into a mirror. And that in itself was an erotic act in Egypt, because mirrors often had handles in the shape of a beautiful woman. But then, when your eye moves down, you see that it gets really quite uh, pornographically raunchy. That actually, this young girl is sitting with her legs wide apart on top of an amphora, which is turned upside down. So the point is inserted inside her. So she's obviously pleasuring herself on this vase, and uh, from the expression on her face, it's working. Uh, it's actually um, very interesting because what's written here is that she's saying to this old man who's with her in this scene, you give me nothing, so I've got to resort to this, to the vase, to give her her orgasm. And then just down here, you can see it's, it's very fragmentary, it's very broken. You just about read out. She's kind of saying, uh, come here, big boy, dirty boy, you kind of sex criminal. Um, he's obviously enjoying this moment because he's got a huge engorged phallus which is resting just next to the amphora. Ultimately, the evidence suggests the Turin erotic papyrus may be the world's oldest men's pornographic magazine. The artist is representing sexual activity with uh, enormous uh, enthusiasm and with lots of salacious detail. I think that he would be a bit like those characters you used to find in Cairo in the old days, who'd sidle up to you uh, and say, hey, mister, you want to see Dirty Picture? I very much like the idea that this is a kind of precursor of Playboy. We may never determine who precisely created the Turin erotic papyrus and for what purpose. What we do know is that 3,000 years later, experts regard it as one of the most important artifacts of antiquity. The priceless thing about this papyrus is that it allows you to decode real Egyptian sexuality. I mean, this is a way that you can understand how the ancient Egyptians had sex, what they enjoyed doing, and what was just a little bit dangerous and naughty for them. At the end of our journey, mysteries still remain about sex in ancient Egypt. But by decoding their imagery, we have pieced together a more complete picture. The Turin erotic papyrus is a lens. It provides a stunning new view into the civilization that created it, shedding light on their beliefs on the afterlife, rituals of fertility, and attitudes toward erotica. An intimate view of sex in the ancient world. <laughs>